Hello and welcome to Concert Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Uh, no Jens today. He is out and under the weather, so I am flying solo for this pod. Um, today on the program, we have a guest that uh, I actually had a chance to interview a few years back. Uh, his name is Robert Berry, and uh, he um, has a new album out, which we're going to talk about in just a, a little bit. But I uh, really enjoyed our, our conversation that we have. We really dug uh, deep on some some stuff and uh, and had a really great chat. So we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, before we do, uh, I want to just kind of give an update on where I'm at, how things are going, um, what what's uh, exciting in my world, um, where it's weird because we're in a time where things don't really get to be exciting or at least it feels that way uh but I have a couple things i'm looking forward to uh which is uh which is a, a breath of fresh air and um and maybe it started after i got the second vaccine shot that um i you know started feeling this sense of relief a sense of kind of hope towards the the future um still taking all safety precautions but you know really seeing the the vaccine roll out to uh so many people and uh and on the heels of it, it rolling out to you know just about every adult um uh, in california i'm you know who's who's interested in um, able to get it i'm i mean i'm pretty excited for that um which leads me to kind of the next thing you know the the california is starting to open up uh, baseball fields again, and I think concert venues uh, soon, which uh, will be interesting. Um, on the baseball side, um, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a moderate uh, baseball fan. Um, I, I root for the A's and the Giants, both local teams. Uh, excited uh, about the, uh, them and get into them when they're doing well. I don't watch every baseball game uh, or anything along those lines, but um, but when I can, I turn it on and, uh, and enjoy watching it. It's always great to go to a game, also especially if you go with people you you care about uh, and uh, and have fun, right? Uh, I think the last baseball game I went to was probably a year and a half ago uh, with uh, my girlfriend and uh, my buddy Joe and his wife. Uh, we all went to in the I think it was. Was it the Giants? It might have been the Giants. And um, no, it had to, it was the A's. Okay, uh, and uh, and had a great time. May have had a couple too many drinks, but um, luckily Joe was driving, so uh, so it was all good. But that leads me to kind of this next thing of you know um, I was talking to my dad the other day, and um, and we were really talking. You know, it was a serious conversation about you know his relationship with my kids and. Um, and the fact that he doesn't really know them that well and doesn't spend any time um, or take the time to uh, spend with them individually. Once in a while, we'll get a, a visit. He lives about an hour away. Uh, and once in a while, we'll get a visit from him uh, for a few hours, but it's usually on a clock uh, and he's got to get back to go home to do nothing, right? Uh, so um, we talked about where things are at and you know, he's vaccinated and now I'm vaccinated. and. Um, and he wants to get to know uh, my kids a little bit more individually, even if on a small scale. And so we were like, hey, let's go to um, an A's game. He lives near uh, the A's stadium. So that's easy and convenient for him. Uh, and it's a day game, so he's not going to fall asleep. And uh, and so I said, okay, sure. We, you know, we looked at times and everything and decided we'll go to the um, A's Mariners game uh, that uh, just so happens to land on uh, my birthday. I'll take the day off of work and um, and I'll bring my son. And so it'll be uh, the three of us. Well, I go to get tickets and they only sell them in pairs or in uh, groups of four for you know COVID spacing reasons. Uh, so, um, so I end up buying four tickets and the fourth one, uh, my dad's kind of antisocial. He's not really into uh, people <laughs> that aren't in his immediate circle. And so I, t uh, I told him I invited my buddy Joe. Uh, we'll see if he can go or not. But um, my dad's not really keen on uh, extra guests. So he'd rather throw away the ticket uh, than, uh, than have an extra guest go. But we'll see how it lines up. Um, so did that. And then uh, I got an email uh, from the Sacramento uh, field for the, from the minor team that, uh, out in Sacramento about Hey, A's Giants uh, uh, spring training game here at uh, 
uh, the Sacramento field. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, we can bring the kids and and go and so and they sell tickets in pairs so and then they skip a row so the kids can be a couple rows ahead of us you know ahead of me and the girlfriend they can have a good time we'll have a good time and then I, I buy the tickets I'm like they're really cheap and then I realize it's the A's and Giants you know minor uh, leagues which was uh, which was pretty funny I'll just say so <laughs> it was uh, but still you know it's it may not be the uh, the front gate uh, you know the the main teams but it'll be you know fun to get out and see this will i mean this will be my first foray into doing something where the, you know the public is around really uh so um you know I, I don't think i'm nervous because i uh think a lot of places are doing everything really safely um and if you're safe along uh with that then uh then you should be okay so uh wear your mask I mean, that's the most important thing, right? Wear your mask, keep your distance. Um, don't be stupid. Don't, you know, uh, do anything like that and get your shot when you can. That's all it comes down to. Let's look out for each other and um, and let's do what we can to get things back to normal because it's been a really rough year for everybody. And I'll tell you, I'm excited for concerts to come back. Uh, I don't know really how I feel fully with uh, the concert thing, you know, doing an outdoor show uh, is one thing if it's not a huge crowd. I don't think I'm ready for a festival yet or anything along those lines, but uh, indoor venues, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not ready for, for that. Uh, I'm not sure when I'll be ready for an indoor uh, show at a club or, you know, a, a theater or anything along those lines where the air is just circulating and, um, and you're with uh, a bunch of strangers for several hours in, in that capacity, even if you're wearing a mask. So um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But I do freaking miss concerts. And I've talked to so many bands about, you know, how we all miss concerts. So I'm ready for them to come back. I want to make sure it's done right. And I'm, it's important to me that, you know, uh, that the concerts I go to, you know, I'm safe as well for myself and those around me, even if I am uh, vaccinated. So um so yeah so that's uh that's kind of the spiel of what i have going on right now so i think now's a good time to bring in robert barry um like i said i got a chance to talk to him from his uh studio actually and uh he has a new uh, 3.2 album that um he put out um uh, called third impression and uh it's it's really cool yeah i recommend checking it out so let's bring in robert barry hey man how are you Hey, doing all right. I can hear you. How are you doing, Robert? I'm good. I'm just, uh, I, I'm taking a break from my session here so we can talk. And uh, they're, they're leaving the control room because I have a, an artist named uh, Randy Remo in who he talks so much. So if I don't get rid of him for, uh, you know, 40 minutes or so, you'll never be able to hear me. Feel, yeah, he'll just, just be talking. talking you feel the love, Randy? I'm feeling a lot of love here. There he is. I'm <laughs> He's just talking about how much love he feels, right? So <laughs> yes, now we're we're finishing his album today. It's it's just turning out so good. This is my studio. This is the console, just so you can see. I mean, the old two inch tapes over there. Wow. And uh, this is my. I have a Neve console. If you know about recording, the the Moog's up there. I mean, there's guitar rooms back there. My Pro Tools is here. Um, you know all the stuff. So this 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 is a real studio. This is a top of the line legit. everything, and I I just love doing it all. I get to do it every day, so it's pretty cool. And so, is this a studio you use to record uh, the new three point two? Just about everything you've heard from me uh, was recorded here. Yeah, it, every band I've been in, they seem to come here be because I can. I wind up doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's awesome. So t uh, tell me a little bit more about the album that you're producing right now. What, what brings you to the studio? Well, you know, it, I'll tell you every day at Soundtech that I don't do my own thing, my own albums or work with the people that I, I work with. Um, I use the equipment I've developed, like that old Neve console, which is very expensive. Have you seen the Sound City movie, Dave Grohl? Yes. And actually, uh, Dave Grohl brought it to Napa and uh, and I saw it when he brought it here to Napa. And uh, and I got to meet him at the uh, the showing and uh, and I'll tell you I did the most badass thing you know like during the previews I went to the bathroom and he was out standing outside 
um, you know, we're talking to the theater staff and everything. And so yeah. I, you know, I went out and I got a picture with him and, uh, and then he shows a documentary while that's going on. I, I sent the picture to my mom and, uh, and had her go to CVS and get an eight by 10 of it. And then afterwards there's a Q and a, and I got him to sign it. Oh, that's cool. Uh, the oh, cool. He was like, wasn't this like an hour ago? But yes, yeah, so I have seen it. And that's an incredible soundboard. And, um, and what a great guy and a big part of music history for eternity. He's preserving and making. But this is one third of that console, Neve console. So, you know, I have really good equipment here and yeah. I use it for everybody I've worked with, you know, um, the guys in Ambrosia, Alliance, the different things. But my album 3.2 stuff, of course, is recorded here. And when I'm not working on my stuff, guys like Randy, who you met a minute ago, are doing their albums here. And I play a lot of instruments, as you can tell by the albums. And most of my service that I do and why I stay so busy is people that don't have bands come in to work with me. Or if they do have a, like if they're a guitar player, singer, and their friend's a drummer and he's playing all over the place, they don't want to deal with that or the guitar players playing his fanciest leads and they don't want to deal with that. They come and have me do the sort of the right, correct track to their song and their vocal thing, you know? Yeah. And uh, Randy, I finished his album. He's been to God, 10 studios over the last 10 years and it just wasn't what he wanted it to be. And he's a friend of a friend of mine. And he said, the guy, let Robert try, you know, see if he can straighten it out. And we're finishing it right before you called. He got a, a copy actually on a CD because he's using that just to transfer it to his computer instead of a thumb drive. So we can work on the order now. And uh, it, I love doing it. Of course, I love doing it for myself and putting out albums and working with everybody from Carl Palmer, Keith Emerson, Steve Howe, all these guys I got to work with. But it's just important to me as in as, as important, come on mouth. I just had my coffee <laughs> um, to work with guys that haven't made it big and want to do something and give them at least the benefit of the experience I've had working with guys like Keith Emerson, let's say, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. And so when you when these um, artists come in and uh, and kind of enlist your, your services, like how do you approach it? How do you kind of bring out what the, you know, what they're looking for in, uh, in their That's projects? a good question really good because a lot of that has nothing to do with what we're going to record a lot of it has to do with psychology of get like like with you okay i can tell you're big on dave gruel you must like yeah. foo fighters i love foo fighters yeah. we got a connection already right yeah and yeah. i like that uh here comes my hero with my foo fighters you know I mean, yeah, yeah. I love, nur, 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 all that kind of double octave stuff on the guitar and that that style of i call it a mesa boogie distortion no matter what he uses you know and um we would start talking about this kind of stuff and you'd say, yeah, but I'm a big Ozzy fan. I want to do my music at Ozzy. I go, okay, well, let, let me, let me think about that. And okay, let's hear your song. Let's hear you sing. Let's hear, oh man, you, 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 Ozzy's not going to work, but you know, what we could use from that kind of era and that style them the metal, more metal thing. We could use this and something more modern like the Foo Fighters and then what you are, what you're capable of as a singer and a player. I add that to the equation as far as what my computer tells me, the way you'll shine. And it's not like we're copying anybody, but kind of everything's been done, even though yeah. it's changing a little bit, you know, Billie Eilish, she, she's not any different than maybe Madonna was on a really soft song. I mean, it's, it's different, but it's not, you know, and, or Marilyn Monroe. She, she had a soft voice. <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, I mean, it doesn't change that much. I just have to take your uniqueness into the equation and make sure that I guide all these influences into your uniqueness and let you shine and, and build the right foundation for your song and your voice. But that's, that's why I love to do it so much. Then of course I get to tour and get on stage and do my own stuff too, which is, that's an honor. When I go out to play, I'm there to thank people. I mean, they might want to hear the songs, but I want to say, hey man, Steve, I thank you, man, for letting me make a life in music. That's really why I'm there. Oh, oh, yeah, I got to play that song. Let me, let me play it. By the way, I really appreciate you coming. You know, <laughs> right, right. Come on, how great is it to be able to do that? And I don't care if it's 150 or 10,000 people out there. It's always the same for me. You know, it's like, wow, I've, I've, I have like 20 albums out and people listen to the music and I can still do music because of it. 
you know, it's pretty good. I mean, I'm happy. <laughs> They're allowing you to do what you love to do, right? So that's right. And not enough people, I think, start to do that at a young enough age. Um, I think no matter what you want to do, if you get into it at a young enough age and you're focused and you have the drive, you can do it at some level. I'm sure I wanted to be, you know, Paul McCartney. I wanted to be Dave Gruel. I want to make all kinds of money and be able to play concerts all the time. That didn't happen for me, but I'm still doing exactly what I love to do. And maybe because I'm not Dave Gruel, I'm, the struggle is real, right? It, yeah, it, it yeah. keeps me writing songs, prolific, whatever you want to call it. And keeps me excited to, oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Maybe I can make this happen tomorrow, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's really cool. And so this past year, how has that changed for you? How has this past year looked in terms of being able to get artists in and uh, and make music and, and you make music yourself as well? What What's interesting for me, because as I told you, I play a lot of instruments, which I think you know. Mm -hmm. And people come in for me to do that with them one at a time. So. Yeah. If I'm worried about somebody, this is a big studio. I mean, it's not huge. It's uh, 12, 1,400 square feet altogether. The control room is 20 by 30. You know, it's, it's, it's a pretty big with 14 foot ceilings. I can stay 20 feet away from somebody and we can work intimately in this studio, you know? So that wasn't a problem. I have a lot of repeat business. A lot of people have come back to have me do songs and albums. So most of the people in the last year I had worked with before. And I was 75% of normal business-wise, plus I finished Third Impression, and I have another album I'm working on for next year now that songs are almost written for, ready to record. And yeah, it's almost normal. You know, I, I'm surprised. Now, I'm in Silicon Valley here, and one mile that way is eBay, where it started, the headquarters. One mile that way is Netflix, where it started, the main headquarters. Two miles that way, do you know the big Apple spaceship kind of building they built, the yep. round one? Yeah. Two miles that way. I mean, then everything else, you know, Twitter, Instagram, I mean, they're all around here. Palo yeah. Alto is a 10 minute drive, which is where all the startup, uh, what do they call that when the startup company, venture capitalists? Venture cap yeah. Right there by the Stanford University. I'm kind of in the heart of this weird area that doesn't live in reality financial wise job wise anything everybody else has a job that doesn't make it especially good for music because we have a lot of high tech people workers here from all different countries all working 10 hour days all when they get off work want to go maybe to a pub have a drink and go to bed they don't want to go out and see a live band or you know they don't have time to support live music they just stream music whatever that comes on so it's not great for me in that way but i also do music for high-tech promotional videos for a new product for apple for whoever i've been doing that for 30 years you know way back yeah. to what was the first silicon graphics this first kind of super computer they did star wars now oh my god these computers look what they're doing i would yeah. do music for their product like internal marketing and stuff so it's been good to make a living and to keep creative but it hasn't been especially good for playing live and getting a band to launch out of here. Most of my success has been in England and with other guys around uh, US, you know? Yeah, and you grew up in the, the North Bay, like San Jose area, right? Right here, yeah. I didn't yeah. grow up in Campbell where my studio is, but yeah. I, I grew up next to a place called the Winchester Mystery House. Yeah, well, I know that I've been there, yeah. There yeah. you go. I, I haven't been there since a, I was a kid, I think, though. I should probably take my kids sometime, but, uh, um, but that's yeah, that place is. Yeah, it's, it's I grew pretty up incredible. There. I grew up there and never went into it until I had kids that I took them, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and so, that, but then you uh, you left the um, the Bay Area and you moved to England, right? And I did. And, and so what inspired that move? You know, in 1986, you were born in what, 85? Uh, no, <laughs> you're not far off. I was going to yeah? say I was three, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I remember you. <laughs> yeah, yeah I know, right? I have in interviewed once before, but <laughs> if you know ELP 86, uh -huh. Carl Palmer called me right here at this studio in Campbell, said yeah. I heard your cassette tape at Geffen Records, and we either want to get you into Asia to replace John Wetton at the time, or I want to start a new band. For the next year, we try to start a new band. 
it wasn't quite right. I was over in England. Steve Howe needed to replace Steve Hackett in a band called GTR. The Asia guitar, the uh, well, Asia, but the Yes guitar player and the Genesis guitar player had a band. The Genesis guitar player left. So I actually joined Steve Howe over there and lived there for a year working with him. It was great with Steve, but the singer caused me trouble in that band. And I've always, I've tried to surround myself with people that are encouraging and I encourage them We work as a team and it's all positive. And this singer was a really a gray cloud over me. So I quit. I don't know why, because they had no success whatsoever in a international way, but I thought something better for me is out there. Carl heard about it. My manager over there called the next day and said, Keith Emerson wants to have lunch with you. Had lunch, started the band with Keith and Carl and stayed another year in England. Then we came back to the US and toured. So that's how, that's why I wound up living there for a while. It was really, for me, being a guy that liked Yes and Genesis and Camel and who else is a, you know, General Giant, all these progressive bands that were pretty big in the 70s when I first started playing in a band. I was in the 80s and I got to play with all these guys. Jeff Downs from Asia, you know, it, mm -hmm. it was a pretty big deal for me over there. I was excited to, to play with my heroes. It'd be like right now, Dave Grohl would, come in and do a song with me at the studio, I'll be like, damn, now that is really cool, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so obviously that lunch spawned, you know, I mean, it was probably the most, you know, amazing lunch for you in terms of memorable towards your life. But, yeah. um, you know, but in terms of working with, with Keith and everything, like what are some of your fond memories of that relationship? Well, I have to tell you something funny. As a guy, you just missed the most important question that a girl asked me. Yeah. Who paid? Who paid for that? <laughs> I went. You know, that was just yesterday. I said nobody's ever asked me that question because mostly, you know, guys are interested in rock and roll. That most interviewers are guys. Yeah, thought, yeah. Now that's a damn good question. Keith paid for the lunch. Yeah, by Keith the way. paid for lunch. Okay, so <laughs> Man, I had no money over there. I had a per diem the manager was giving me to live every every week, kind of, but not the kind of money that the places they went to. You know. Um, yeah. I forget the question now. <laughs> <laughs> your fond memories you have of your relationship with Keith. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, first of all, at that lunch, I had worked with a lot of famous people at that point and was never worried about it. I thought I could hold my own. But with Emerson, it was like, oh, my God. I thought I was going to meet Albert Einstein. He would talk in equations so far above my head. He wouldn't be able to complete a sentence because he's this mad genius, which he was. Mm -hmm. He was the most easygoing funny guy, comfortable. I, I can't say enough good things about the very first time I ever met him at that lunch. It was just great. He only had one question after a two hour lunch. He goes, well, Robert, you know, if I like your material, if we were to start a band, I got to ask you something. I'm thinking, uh oh, he wants every third male child, right? When I have kids. He goes, would you mind playing a couple ELP songs when we went on tour? And I, I, I should have said, uh, Keith, I, you, I'll get back to you on that. I don't think so. <laughs> but no, I thought, come on. I was I was honored to say, of course, that's your history. And I said, wouldn't an audience want to hear that? I mean, how great would that be for me to be able to, to sing Lucky Man, let's say. Well, yeah, that wasn't the case when we toured. I had to play the really hard instrumental stuff. So <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, put it to work. <laughs> oh, man, it was tough. But it was still good. You know, it, it, the audiences loved it. He... Uh, the first time I went to his house, Carl drove me from downtown London, where I live. Carl picked me up in his little Mercedes. We drove there, and here's the Emerson Estate, Stonehill House, big iron gates, just as you'd imagine, like a mansion, three-story thing. And at the top window, there's this little window, and that I found out later was their bedroom, uh, bathroom and stuff up there. But at the time, I didn't know. And we got to the gate, and Carl's going, Emerson, Emerson. They hear this, yes, guys. What, what, are you, you here to rehearse? Yeah, yeah, where are you? He goes, I'm up here. And we looked up at that window, and there he is, like Jim Carrey, speaking with his butt cheeks. Oh, he has dude. his butt out the window. Yeah, uh -huh. I'll be right there. And I thought, it's this guy. And Carl looked at me and goes, Oh, Emerson. <laughs> but he was so, he, that's who he was. He was so funny, you know. Um, other things I can remember him because we traded songs. He had some songs, I had some songs. So we were 50-50 on the music, you know, 
uh, writing wise and song wise, but we would interject our piece of it into the other people's music. And he would have maybe in the middle of a song like uh, one of the songs on the first album was Lover to Lover. I know it was a, you do or you don't. It was a ballad. He goes in the middle, it has to, we got to do a key change. You go, oh, no, I, that, that'd be weird to sing. Go, no, no, trust me on this. I go, oh, I don't know. Well, I couldn't. That song is so perfect with that key change in it, you know, but he was thinking at a different level, deep in the musicality and the technicality and stuff. And I was just kind of throwing it out from the heart, sort of, you know, so yeah. it took me a while to switch gears. But once, oh, I said, wow, Keith, that's tremendous. Wow. I, yo, I get it now. So those things happen a lot. I had eight years of classical piano and two years of jazz. So what was good for me that nobody ever knew is that every day at rehearsal and on tour, it was a piano lesson for me because I'd be watching, you know, he'd get up on the piano and, 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 and tour and play it backwards and the, all the organ and play it backwards. And I'd be, how in the hell, what's he doing? That's, I, and I still can't do it, right? Yeah. It's amazing. It's a whole different instrument backwards. But I'd watch his chord formations. Uh, when he soloed, you know, the violence and the, the way he played, I was like, wow, man. And the knives in it and all that. It was a absorbing music lesson, life changing experience for me in a way that I can't explain it any deeper than that, except for it sort of entered my heart and soul and my brain all at the same time because I had 10 years of piano lessons and I majored in music in college while I had a band that was touring around called Hush, my first professional band yeah. that had a record contract and did quite well. But here I'm working with the king of keyboards you know it was really something yeah and uh, and so uh when talking about hit number nine on the billboard charts tell me where you're at kind of during that experience what was that like for you you know and what did it mean it was interesting because i wrote that song i had it before three started i did that song in gtr with steve howe and if if you knew an old yes album they had a song called going for the one and he did the vibrato on guitar that goes down, 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 which way back was a Dwayne Eddy kind of thing. So that riff of talking about was done by Steve Howe. Down, 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 down. Okay. And then Max Bacon, the singer that I had trouble with, was singing it. Now, in the U.S. to say talking about, it's no big deal. But in England, it's talking about. He can't sing talking about. He has a talking about you. So, <laughs> that was weird for me right there. It never quite sounded right, although the Steve Howe guitar stuff was really good. So I brought that with me to three, and Keith said, oh, wait, oh yeah, that's, that's built for me. And he, when he put his chord structures in there and the sound, it made it something super special. We're on tour. I'm trying to think of where we started. I don't even know where we started. We started up upper, upper state New York, went around the Midwest, Canada, and all that. By the time we got down to, to Texas, is where to hit number nine. And every DJ, because we go to a, a radio station everywhere we went, would always say in 88, that song sounds so good in our station because you know, Guns N' Roses, Nirvana are kind of taking over that grunge style is coming in. And that song, well, when it comes on, the richness and the bigness, it sounds really good. We're thinking, well, the program director's like it. That's interesting, you know, but okay. And then we get, to texas and it's number nine so we were like oh i guess they meant what they said because they drove it up the charts just by radio playing it and people buying the, the album because radio was the promotional technique then there was no facebook and instagram yeah, no, and it Twitter didn't. And all. there was barely even cell phones cell phones were the size of a briefcase you know oh yeah so yeah. it was different radio was the tool and it served us well and do you remember the first time you heard yourself on the radio your music well, I, I was um, in Hush. I was uh, 20 years old when a local guy named The Lobster, DJ, heard this song called Rock and Roll Babies. And I had written this song with a friend of mine. It was about, hey, we were raised on rock and roll. Rock and roll, babies, got the music in our soul because we were raised on rock and roll, right? Mm -hmm. And as a DJ on an FM station that was totally wacko guy and a good guy, but so into music and just probably had a record collection the size of this room kind of guy he related to that song and he started playing it and then he had us into the studio to do an interview and stuff and i mean we had just started you know our first album so 
yeah, that was pretty exciting. Hearing talk about in every city we went to, because we had a bus tour, we were on a couple of big buses. Wow. That was a reward that I'll never be able to repeat now because radio only plays the same 15 songs per format. And I don't stream. Uh, I don't have time to, to listen to whatever comes up. You know, I, I'm recording it every day in the studio, I'm recording a client or myself. And when I'm out of here at seven o'clock, the radio does not come on. I don't want to hear any more sound. You heard enough music for the day, right? You got it. And, and what's interesting, though, is I'll have, I mean, I'll do uh, hip hop songs for like 16 year old, 7 year old girls doing their first recording because their dads say, you got to go to the studio. We got to get you a good sound to start with. And I'm capable of doing that because, like I say, everything's kind of been done. It's just reorganized a little bit, a lot of drum loops. That's easy to do. Um, I'll do a lot of country music. And so, I'll get exposed to Taylor Swift, let's say. Uh, I'll get exposed to whoever's, whatever hip hop's on. There's so many artists. I can't even tell you one name. There's a billion of them, you know? But we'll play that and I'll do that thing where I go, oh, so really, you you think you want to sound like Taylor Swift, but this is like a, this is the other guy, you know? So, you know, Taylor, really? Oh, so it's country, but you sing like Rod Stewart from the 70s. I mean, we, we, we got to find a, a, you know, put that together. So I do get exposed to all the new music that way. I just don't listen to it in the car or, or sit back and yeah. listen. No. Yeah, you get your exposure. Yeah. Um, you, you created a rock opera like at 19 years old where you played all the instruments. I was, what I was, was 17 and 18. That was the senior in high school when that happened. Yeah. Um, I, I had one of the first four track, my dad, had, I should start, my dad had a music story, pianos and organs. And at a certain point he had Vox guitars and amps. And which is what the Beatles use, great stuff. The country guys, a lot of guys, uh, uh, Brian May and Queen uses the Vox amp. And so all these bands that were doing well would come to my dad's store and buy the Vox amps. They wanted what the Beatles used. Later on, I was inspired that these guys were doing certain things and one of them had a tape store where he'd sell cassette tapes and eight track tapes and stuff. And I told my dad, you know, Tiak put out a four track and I think that drummer from that band that has the tape store He can get T. Dad called him, shoot. Are you still there? Yep, yep, I gotcha. I that was my but that was my accountant calling. <laughs> he's, come, he's coming in tomorrow. I'm gonna have to talk to him. And I don't know if I can put you on hold on Zoom. So I don't want to do that. I just uh, take him, took him off. Anyway, he called the guy, got the first four track T act that I could get. And I started to learn all these instruments and stuff to sort of copy songs that I liked and how they got the tone with microphone. So I had to get a whole drum set with two mics. And I just learned how to record at home. I took it to a real studio to get a mix of these four tracks. And guys said, well, you get good sound. Where'd you record this? In my garage. Your garage. He had the best everything. It sounded better than what he was doing or as good. We hired me at a studio called T. And I worked there for 10 years from about 17 to 27. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. I was lucky. Um, lucky. Yeah. Have you worked with Greg Kinn recently? Greg was in last Thursday. He's supposed to be in tomorrow. And my accountant called. You just heard that. And tomorrow mm -hmm. I had to cancel Greg. I said, Greg, I got to get my taxes done. You know, it's that time. Got to figure out this last year, you know, what it looks like. So we got to not do it this week. But yep, I'll be talking. Greg will be in next week. He's he's not happy because we had this song he's really excited about. And usually it's okay. Well, yeah, you know, if we can't do a week, no big deal. This one, he's all, oh man, I'm ready for this song. We can finish this. This is a good one, right? So I got to call him back. He left me a message saying how disappointed he was that he's not coming in. We have a <laughs> great time. He's excited about the new stuff. Yeah. Um, we, we, you know, we get together every week if we can down at Sound Tech here and we write. And you know, it takes about two years to get enough songs we think are good enough to be like the last album, Rekindled. We're, yeah. we're, that's a real great Ken album. We're really proud of it. And that's part of the hats I wear. Even Greg brings in songs that aren't Greg Kin songs. I go, you know, you don't sound like Greg Kin. Oh, what do you mean, Roger? What do you mean? 
Well, I know Greg Kinn. That, that's not the kind of song he'd write, you know? And he, he, he listens to me now. He goes, yeah, maybe you're right about that. You know, you're talking about this and that. Um, anyway, we have a really good writing relationship, working relationship, friendship. Um, he's, he's really, you know, I've been in the band 15 years or something. He's one of my best friends now, besides this music thing we do together. Yeah. Did you, did you play with him? Um, I want to say, I, I saw him live a couple of years ago, opening for Huey Lewis, um, Thunder Valley. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 That was a really, really fun show. It was a really hot show on the stage because the sun. Yes. Out. By the time he was he came on, the sun was down. He's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I remember. I remember that show, and it was really good. And I've I've talked to I've interviewed Greg a couple of times, and he's a he's a really fun guy, Bay Area Bay Area guy too, right? So yeah, um, yeah. so that's cool. I'm glad he's got some new stuff cooking. Um, so so talk to me about the new uh, 3.2. I mean, because uh, so I read uh, a quote. You said that. Um, that even though you had some unused material, you don't think you'll ever follow up from the first album uh, that right. just holds too many important memories that can never be repeated. So tell, tell me kind of what brought you from where that was to, um, to kind of revisiting the material. And I appreciate that question a lot. Not a lot of people um, care about this piece of it. You know, um, when I did that album, Keith and I were working on the whole thing and he committed suicide in the middle of it. It was hard for me. I wasn't even gonna finish that one, but two years later, talking to his son, everybody, and it was such great material. I, I said, well, I'm gonna finish it and see how it goes. I finish it, the record company says, we gotta put this out. It gets rave reviews, does better than I ever expected. I thought it'd be criticized, not one criticized uh, review. They all liked it. Then the record company calls, you need to do a follow-up. I said, I only have one song left that Keith and I did. and um, it's nine minutes, but it was too long for the last albums. I didn't use it, but I said, I, I don't want to do a follow-up. They said, well, let's, let me tell you this. We have White Snake. We have Yes. We have all these bands in our label. We know what they sell. We can't tell you, but let's just tell you that the, the rules have changed, did really well. It did really well. You sold a lot of copies. We can't tell you what they sell, sold, but you did really well. You need to do a follow-up. You're on a roll here. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna write seven songs that I think that Keith would have liked to have worked on or would have approved of in some way. After all, I was half the writer, he was half the writer. I was the voice of three, he was the sound. I have, I showed you the moke, I have all the sounds. I'm capable of playing, I'm no Keith Emerson, but I'm capable of playing, I know how to use those sounds and we did all this together. So I said, I'll see what I can do like the, the previous album, the stuff just kind of flew out of me. And I don't know if the inspiration I say, you know, was Keith, is he inspiring me from well, being hell? Because he, he wouldn't want to go to heaven. That's no fun. Is he inspiring yeah. me from hell? <laughs> or, or is it just that he's entered my mind and my heart and soul so much that I resonate with this music of three, which I have deep ownership in, you know, I was one third of it and then one half of it. And this time I'm almost all of it, except for one song. I got it all done. I went back to finish the song, Never. I went, wow, I, I didn't realize what a great piece of music this was. And I sent it to the record company. I said, well, this is what I came up with. And I'm half honoring what three was. And half of it, I am moving on to what I will do in the future. Because this is it. The one song, I will not do a three album without Keith involved in it, at least one of the writing things. And it is nine minutes, so it's a big chunk, you know. Yeah. And they said, this is exactly what you needed. This is a great album. It's a transition album to what you do next, but it pays a lot of homage to, to the band three. Homage, I guess, not homage. Homie. <laughs> <laughs> and so I let them put it out. They did the first video, Fond Farewell. It was a tremendous, great job in the video. I was so that they asked me if they could do it. I said, well, an idea. Yeah, I do it. They've done such a good job. The reviews have been better than the rules of change, which surprised me. I thought people would say, well, it's a nice follow up. And they're saying we like it better almost in every instance, which if they like it as well, is good enough for me. But I'm pretty excited about it. I'm going, oh, my God, you know, because this is it. There will be no more three music. And 
it's a li little bit melancholy. You know, I had that one song and I showed you the Pro Tools earlier. On my hard drive, Keith and I worked on, it was just mine. He was still alive here in Sound Tech, just for me. And, I, and now it's out to the world, which is great. But as far as having that little something special here that, I don't know, I, I just felt an ownership, you know, uh, like having a, a joke that somebody tells you, you don't tell anybody because it's too personal or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's, it's done. I have no, nothing else except for I have great reviews. I think I've honored his involvement, how great he was, how important he was to me in, with this series of three albums that we pretty much did all together, you know? So that's why I did the album and that's why I'm talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think it's a great follow up and, you know, and it, like you said, it does pay homage to it. And, and it, I know it's really personal for you, of course. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad you're able to kind of revisit it. And, and also, I mean, along those lines, just how meticulous you are with it, because I, I know, you know, uh, you had to, um, I, I don't know if it was this album or just you know, the entire three, three, you know, touching the three uh, as a whole, but you had to reproduce like each note exactly as it was, right? Yes, because we had his plane and the estate board wouldn't let me use it because they want him remembered as a composer. This is the greatest keyboard player ever lived to shove knives on his keyboards, threw the organ on its back on top of him, shot flames out of his mug. That's yeah. the Jimi Hendrix of the keyboards. He's not just a writer, you know? And he played like his left hand was amazing. His right hand is amazing. He played like nobody else ever will, except for Jordan Rudis, maybe if you know who that is, Jordan's amazing. And I said, okay, if that's what I have to do, I'm capable of doing that. I used to did a lot of sound alikes for a, a karaoke revolution, which was a computer game or a, a CD-ROM game where I had to copy hit songs. I mean, I'm capable of doing that. And they didn't realize that I could do it. Where I, I've only played it for one guy, and Neil Prasad is a very famous writer. He had to come down here to see if I was telling the truth or not. So he heard Keith's stuff, he heard what I did, and he just sat there dumbfounded. I said, you okay? What? You, you, what? He goes, I'm having to come with terms that this isn't Keith playing that, but it's him playing that because I can't tell the difference, basically. You know. Yeah. And I mean, that's something I could do. I'm not bragging. I'm, I could never be Keith. He's, he was amazing. But you know, 50% of this album is just, actually 75% of this one is just me. 50% of the last one was just me because I had to complete it. So yeah. um, it's not all just recreating Keith's parts, you know, but he did do them first. So I wish I could have just used it. It would have been a lot easier on me and it would have meant just as much to the music. It would have meant more to the music, right? But it's still his sound and his creation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Quick aside back to the uh, uh, Greg Kin show. I'm, uh, I found a, uh, a photo I took from the show. <laughs> so, ah, yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm always egging him on, egging him and, and Rye, his son, egging him on to do something, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Looks like you guys had a lot of fun. but uh, yeah, as, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. As we wind out, you had mentioned a uh, new album that you're working on. What can you tell me about that, uh, that new album? I'm writing and I can't tell you anything about it. <laughs> All right. That was fun. It's, so. it's a next year's project. And um, I am using this transition of third impression, the music on it, to if, if this is the first song, uh, Top of the World, it's got much more of me in it because I'm a little bit of a, a Zeppelin kind of fan you know and something a little more rocking so i put more of that into the style and that's heading more to what i do on my own and uh the next year's album i just can't say too much but it has a it has an amazing player on it like in a keith emerson but in the guitar sense so um, that's all i'll say i'm looking for a drummer someone like a terry bozio that wants to be in a band so that that's that's where i'm at right now yeah, and I bet you're excited to get back out and play some shows when, you know. And so is Greg. Again. Yeah, Greg yeah. can't wait. He's just uh, so, so bored not playing, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah. I look forward to, you know, seeing you guys out there uh, again on the road soon. And, uh, um, and yeah, thank you, uh, Robert, for taking the time and, uh, and chatting and, uh, and for the album. It's, it's really great. I, 
I appreciate your help with promoting the album and stuff. It means a lot to me to talk. You know, the record company said, well, we did all the big magazines, all the big stuff, you know, 40 of them. I did a bunch of interviews and stuff. I said, yeah, but there's all, and not offensively, there's all these little guys that have their reach. And I got it. You can have a magazine of 5,000 readers or viewers online and five people will buy an album. Or you can have a guy that has 100 or, or even 50 and they're going to go, oh, because they like you. They know you. They're closer into your circle. We, we got to listen to that. We got to see what that is. I'm a firm believer in the record company said, well, we're not going to do that. So I hired my own guy, John Lappin, who knows John you. John Lappin. Oh, yeah. And he did the last one, did a tremendous job. He made all the difference to just getting the word out there that the music is what it is and and like talking like the guys like you that appreciate it and i don't know i think it's good for longevity and everything else it's good for the next one it's it's just it's good for keith's reputation everything you know it just to just to go with the big magazines where people i don't know what they're i don't know they're they're yeah. trying to be the real deal and i find the guys like you are more honest about it you're like music fans yeah. and it's a whole different feel. So I really enjoy this piece of it a lot. So yeah, thank it's you. A lot, it's a lot of fun for me too, you know, so cool. to get an insight into, you know, the process and everything and, um, you know, to get to see, hear about your personal experiences with it. So, yeah, so it's great. All right, so, man. Well, all right. I appreciate it. Back, back to the album you're working on. And <laughs> back, yeah, I gotta, I gotta get him the rest of his, his stuff and talk about everything else that seal it up, get him his copies and all that. But, I'll definitely be talking to you next year. Trust me. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Let's keep it going. All right. Have a good one, okay, Robert. Thank you. Later. See you later. That was the interview with Robert Berry here on Concert Pipeline. And that takes us to the final segment on the program, the music news. Uh, I have a couple of stories to wind out the program today, uh, and I'm going to start off with one uh, about DMX. Uh, he is on life support following a heart attack, um, and his uh, attorney said, it would be disingenuous of me to suggest that I am not a worried man. Uh, DMX was taken to a New York hospital Friday night following a reported drug overdose. The rapper's attorney confirmed to Rolling Stone that he's currently hospitalized and on life support. TMZ first reported Saturday the DMX was in grave condition. Two sources said that the rapper is in a vegetative state uh, or has some brain activity after a reported drug overdose triggered a heart attack. He was rushed to White Plains New York Hospital late Friday night and placed in the critical care unit. Um, and the rapper's attorney couldn't confirm whether the heart attack was drug related. Um, his health status was murky as of Saturday evening due to conflicting reports. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, let's see, Richmond first confirmed to uh, PIX11 that the rapper had suffered a heart attack and has been taken off life support system and is breathing on his own. Uh, he had, uh, let's see, he said uh, to Rolling Stone later that evening that he, that he was given wrong information. He said that the rapper remains on life support. Okay, hard to tell what's going on there. Um, and so, he remains in critical condition the last uh, of this update. Um, he's been a uh, warrior his entire life. This situation represents yet another road he must conquer. Uh, this uh, side added that per family member, the rapper's children have flown in to uh, see him. Um, he has long struggled with drug issues, most recently in October 2019, when he canceled a series of tour dates in order to return to a drug habilitation center. Uh, so... Um, so thoughts go out to DMX and his uh, family during this challenging time. Hopefully he's able to push through because um, that's a, that, that's, you know, heart attack isn't a joke. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just really, really rough. So I want to make sure he's doing okay. And hopefully he can, you know, put the, the drugs behind him when he uh, comes out of this on the other side. Um, all right. Uh, next story is about Finn Wolfhard. Uh, from Stranger Things, and you might say, "Well, uh, Finn Wolfhard—that's the—that's the kid from Stranger Things, right?" I didn't know he was a musician. Well, he has a band called the Aubreys, and they've finished recording their debut album. Uh, and uh, he, 
Uh, the group comprised of Wolfhard and drummer Malcolm Craig who released their debut EP Sodas and Pie in March of 2020. And then on Thursday, April 1st, uh, they confirmed they've officially finished recording their new album via Instagram. After thanking those involved the, with the project, the duo wrote, duo wrote, Baby, we are wrapped on recording our first LP. Uh, thank you, Tacos. Thank you, Cats. Thank you, Yo-Yo Ma's cousin. See everybody outside again real soon. Um, and um, that back in January, the duo dropped new song, No Offerings, uh, featuring Lunar Vacation. They followed this up in February with another new track, Sand in My Bed, an ode to the lost summer of 2020. Uh, and Wolfhard told Consequences of Sound, uh, we were apart from our friends for the most part, not collaborating other, collaborating other than over the internet. And we also had both just graduated. So much should have happened, but there wasn't much we could do. Uh, and uh, the idea was we're running out of time. We finally get to water and, and our, our payoff is a ferocious sunburn. Um, so um, he spoke to NME about the Aubrey's last year. And he said, this is the first time that we've collaborated on original uh, songs together. Uh, so um, he had a previous band called uh, Calpurnia and then he said it's not like Malcolm didn't have a say but there were just more people so it was harder to do and we'd have to answer to each other whereas with the Aubrey's all we were answering to is ourselves and one another so um, meanwhile production on Stranger Things season four is currently underway following the uh, various coronavirus related setbacks release date has not yet been announced for that so but I will be watching when that uh, comes around. This is an interesting story. Um, AI software writes new Nirvana and Amy Winehouse songs to raise awareness for mental health support. Uh, the program has created new tracks uh, by other stars who died at 27 for the project. Uh, and the um, uh, Toronto organization Over the Bridge has created a compilation featuring songs created via artificial intelligence in the style of musicians who died at the age of 27. Drowned in the Sun, Lost Tapes of the 27 Club, collates these songs, which were largely created by computers to draw attention to musicians' struggles with depression and mental health issues, as well as the support to offer them. What if these musicians that we love had uh, mental health support? Sean O'Connor, a member of the board of directors for Over the Bridge, told Rolling Stone. Somehow, in the music industry, depression is normalized uh, and romanticized. Their music is seen as uh, authentic suffering. The, uh, the tracks in the compilation, which also uh, the styles of Jimi Hendrix and the Doors are made through Google's AI program Magenta, which analyzes the, an artist's previous work in order to learn how to compose like them. Another AI program was then used to create the lyrics. Um, uh, the Nirvana song that was created is called uh, Drowned in the Sun. Uh, then the, the front man of Atlanta's Nevermind, the ultimate tribute to Nirvana, handled the vocals. If you look at the last quote, unquote, Nirvana release, which was, you know, you're right. This has the same type of vibe, Eric Hogan said. Kurt would just sort of write whatever the hell he felt like writing. And if he liked it, then that was a Nirvana song. I could hear certain things in the arrangement of Drown Out the Sun, like, okay, that's kind of an in utero vibe right here, or a Nevermind vibe right here. I really understood the AI of it. So interesting technology. Apparently bands don't need to create their own music anymore when uh, we have AI to do it, right? Um, and going from Nirvana, um, we'll roll into the, our final story, which has to do with Dave Grohl. Um, we always try and close out with the Dave Grohl story. And uh, Dave Grohl's favorite bar is uh, launching the world's first online pub. And this is another uh, weird time that we're in sort of a story, right? Uh, so, the Crow Bar, the legendary rock bar, is launching the world's first online pub. Uh, the bar is a favorite of Foo Fighters frontman Dave Grohl. Uh, it confirmed in September that it would be closing due to lost earnings due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, however, the bar recently raised 40,000 pounds from a crowd funder. An additional 30,000 pounds has also been raised. They aim to launch in a new location in central London when the pandemic ends. What a party that'll surely be. Uh, so on the virtual bar side, um, you know, the uh, virtual bar allows people to have a, a, a natter, lift their spirits and be themselves. So the Crow Bar launched this online pub. The owner, Richard Thomas, described this as an opportunity to help his customers and anybody else who wants to join in by creating a secure and controlled space where anybody is welcome to have a natter, lift their spirits and be themselves. The Crow Bar virtual pub will be available online every Friday from 3 p.m. to Saturday, 3 p.m. 
I imagine that's UK time. So nine hours ahead of Pacific. Um, and customers will only need to register once to gain access to the every event. People will be able to create their own tables or move around other tables in groups of eight. Uh, even with, when the pubs reopen, the virtual bar will remain available for people still affected by the pandemic. Uh, and fundraising is also still active. Donations from the likes of Judas Priest and Rival Sons are still, uh, still available in the raffle. Um, there's more information there. So, um, and the bar's owner, Richard Thomas, had this to say, my customers are my priority and without them, we'd not have reached this fantastic amount of 70,000 pounds, uh, uh, which is no mean feat. He added, but since we closed down our physical location and started this crowdfund, the amount of people who have shared how much uh, loss they felt since that fateful Facebook post is immeasurable. It's why with the help of hard work of some techie fans, we were able to set up an online pub to recreate that safe zone. Uh, where people can chat, giggle, and share stories without judgment and reattune their social skills again. They are free to create their own tables or float around other tables with groups, groups of up to eight. So there were some pilot tests before this launched um, and, um, and they are rolling it out, which is uh, pretty cool. So uh, uh, in Dave Grohl news as well, uh, Foo Fighters are to feature in a new horror comedy film uh, and there's... A, uh, a whole story on that, um, which is uh, uh, which is pretty interesting. So um, it's for Universal Pictures, um, and that was first reported on the horror fan site, Bloody Disgusting. According to the report, their movie was filmed in secret during the pandemic, um, and I'm not sure what the Foo Fighters involvement is, but the plot centers around the band Foo Fighters being haunted during a recording session and becoming possessed. Uh, so um, the reports are unconfirmed by official sources. Many industry insiders have confirmed the news. And um, and so it's, uh, Dave Grohl said this, uh, when we walked into the house in Encino, I knew the vibes are definitely off, but the sound was fucking on. We started working there and it wasn't long before things started happening. We would come back to the studio the next day and all the guitars would be detuned or the setting we'd put on the board, all of them had gone back to zero. We would open up a Pro Tool session and tracks would be missing. There were some tracks that were put on there that we didn't put on there, but just like weird open mic noises, nobody playing an instrument or anything like that, just an open mic recording a room. Um, and uh, he went on to add, and we'd fucking zero in on sounds within that. And we didn't hear any voices or anything really decipher decipherable, but something was happening. Um, and the Foo Fighters even brought in a baby monitor to uh, find out what was happening, but the bands are sworn to Sukashi on what they found. So um, he said, it got to the point where I brought one of those nest cams uh, and I still have it home for when my kids would sleep in their cribs. Uh, I set it up overnight so we could see if there was anyone there or anyone was coming to fuck with us. Uh, at first, nothing. And right around the time we thought we were ridiculous and we were out of our minds, we started to see things on the nest cam that we couldn't explain. Then when we found out about the history of the house, I had to sign a fucking non-disclosure agreement with the landlord because he's trying to sell the place and he added uh so i can't give away what happened there in the past but these uh, multiple occurrences over a short period of time it's finished the album uh, as quickly as we could so um it's interesting stories by dave Grohl and Foo fighters for sure all right so that is our show for today uh i want to thank robert barry for being on the program uh, next week on the show, we'll have a band called 40 Feet Tall. They're from Portland, Oregon, and uh, we're going to chat with them next time. So uh, for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, I'm Steve Jones. We'll catch you next time.